So before we get started properly talking about small hours, I have to mention Isaac and the Egg, um, which was your debut, an instant bestseller, and um, probably embarrassing to say, but rocketed you to fame, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the process of having your first book published and it having such an impact on so many people's lives? I mean, it's great. It's, it's a good <laughs> feeling. Uh, it, it's, it's weird because it doesn't necessarily... It was my first book that came out, but I had written a book before Isaac and the Egg that never, nothing mm -hmm. ever happened with. So I, I used to be a journalist. Um, I kind of had this idea for a novel. What, I was working as a freelance journalist, and I, I wrote... I spent like a year and a half, two years writing this book that, in manuscript form, I managed to get an agent on the back of we took it to publishers and no one wanted it. It was devastating, it was the, the worst feeling for a writer. Um, so then when Isaac happened, and I kind of I kind of wrote Isaac in the Egg to take my mind off that one, uh, but it also happened to be the, the first COVID lockdown, so all the, it, it became a really intense writing experience. I wrote it in about four months. Wow. Um, and I had the opposite experience with it when, when we took it out to publish it. I, I knew, I already had the agent, so I knew some, at least one person had to read it. Um, and, and when we took it to publishers, um, I think we had our first offer in about 24 hours. So wow. it was like the two most different scenarios it, 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 could, it could possibly be. Um, so it kind of, it didn't feel totally overnight, but it was, because that had happened, it was a nice... It made it feel sweeter. It made it feel more like I understand that this isn't the, the norm. Um, and yeah, I mean, since then, it's, it, things have just been mad, but it's, it's been amazing. And it's, it's, it was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of waiting in publishing. So there were two years between the book deal and the book coming out. Um, a lot of twiddle on my thumbs and, and just like hoping for the best, but punctuated by these really big unexpected moments like um going to watch the audiobook be recorded by johnny flynn the actor that was like an incredible moment um and just kind of the endorsements coming in from from other authors it's the, all these little things leading up to publication and then suddenly it's published and your life changes and then and then you can mainly because you can go around going like i'm an author uh, which is what you want anyone who writes a book really wants, wants to be able to do is be like, i'm an author um so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say fame, but uh, it's it's been really nice having people connect with the book. It's a book about some really hard topics. It's a book about grief mainly, and I think the nicest thing has been when you write a book like that, you worry that um, you're not you, you're not doing it right, or you're kind of um, taking advantage, or you're or you're not or you're not kind of respecting something that needs deserves to be respected so i think the nicest thing has been any of my fears around that being totally the opposite um and the amount of emails and messages i get from people who have been through similar things as isaac in the book or who have just you know connected with it or found that it's it's helped them or, or that they've they've seen themselves in it i think that those are the the nicest things i think and you mentioned that it was a lockdown book mm. how did you come up with the idea um specifically how do you come up with an egg <laughs> so I, obviously i always get asked this um i don't remember it ever i don't remember ever being like well i'll do uh, it'll be an egg it was always an egg it was always an egg and it was it was from the from the get-go called isaac and the egg i knew i wanted to do a book that was a really serious book that also had the most stupid and implausible character standing in the middle of it so mm -hmm. the original inspiration was the the viral uh star wars character baby yoda that was like a, a character literally designed to sell merchandise it was like the cutest thing ever but so manipulatively cute and i was like imagine if you did that you did the kind of like a uh, gizmo uh ewok type creature paddington bear but you put him in like the darkest bleakest just most adult story <laughs> the challenge for the writer would then be like how do you make that work how do you make that not seem like you're just kind of making fun of of mm. of, of uh, the reader how can you actually 
create something that that has more to it than just that joke mm. um and that you know it was a really entertaining writing process in that respect and it um i was really influenced by stuff like max porter grief is the thing with feathers uh patrick nessa monster calls mm. those are both books where grief is a character it's a monster mm. um and in this one grief would be a monster but but it'd be really funny because you know dark things grief things like that that they are they can be funny in the in the in the chaos and in the way they upend your life and and have you acting like an alien you know i think that was kind of the idea behind it and um when i first conceptualized the book it was a, it was a pretty much out and out black comedy and what it became i would say comedy is probably only a little mm -hmm. part of it um and that was really having that really intense lockdown writing experience and, and i hate it when authors say like and i got to know the characters <laughs> but i didn't get to know them. you know you you you, right. you spend time with these characters and you develop them and you realize that they i think i had the same experience with both books you realize i realized that the the human characters were the interesting ones Definitely. throughout the writing process yeah. i also want to talk a bit about uh jerry who yeah. um is a character that for me personally has meant a great deal um as you mentioned he's someone who's living with a condition where he loses his memory um you don't name it but it kind of mirrors maybe dementia or alzheimer's or something a little bit like that and i i just thought it was so beautiful and so moving the way like you sort of described the way you wrote his narration and there's a quote in it which i'm probably going to mess up now but it's like memory as, as a lake almost mm, yep. the way his thoughts and his experiences happen at once but also separately and visually on the page as well um if such when you read it um it really you get this real sense of how he is experiencing the world. And I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about how you went about researching that point mm. of view and how that, that came to you um, and your experiences with that. So I, you know, I often get asked a, a similar question about the grief and I was in the egg. And I think I have, a, I have a, the same answer here, which is I was really coming at both books primarily from a, a, a viewpoint of writing about masculinity and writing mm. about men. Um, Isaac was a man who kind of puts all his emotional baggage on his life partner and then is never serious emotionally available with his friends. So when he loses his partner, he has no one to talk to and in comes the egg. Uh, Jerry and Jack were two men who come from different generations but are both incredibly stubborn and incredibly um, unable to, to say what they really feel um, for different reasons. Um, so I knew that they would have this feud that had gone on for years and that would be, to everyone else apart from them, very clearly pointless. Um, so really, Jerry's condition originally was, uh, yeah, in the first idea of the book, nothing more than a plot device, it was what happens if one of them starts to forget? And then that that feud is shown to be a totally pointless but e, a lot of wasted time um then once again you know you start writing a book and you start to get to know the characters and jerry i think was the has always been the most vivid character for me in this book um i knew when i was writing him i knew he was going to be living with yes something basically alzheimer's or, or dementia but I also knew I was going, never going to name it, mm. uh, partly because I didn't. I'm not an expert, and I didn't. I didn't want to to kind of write like I was. Uh, partly because I knew that to write the plot of a book, there would have to be things where it might not exactly work in the way it would in the in the real world. Um, but yeah, mainly because I, it it wasn't a book about that. Mm. However, I knew when I was writing about something like that that I did have to put in the work because mm. you. You have to, you can, you know, you, you can't, you can't half ask something like that. So I worked with a brilliant charity called Dementia UK, who were um, absolutely incredible at giving me advice, really kind of granular advice on, you know, how, how, how that condition would manifest the sort of things that Jerry would experience, but also the things I was planning to write that wouldn't, that didn't make sense. So it, they helped me kind of get it as close to, to what the reality would be as possible. But I also was hugely influenced by a brilliant writer who recently passed away, Wendy Mitchell. Um, she has written extensively about what it's actually like to live with dementia. Um, and I think what always 
what I always got from her writing was this sense of joy and of still being around and 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 of people kind of treating of 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 very much resisting the idea that people would treat her like she was already gone or like she was part of the furniture. Uh, so I was very aware of writing Jerry. I wanted to confront those things head on. I wanted him to very much address the fact that even the, the family members who love him kind of pick him up and put him down on the sofa or, or you, they they talk over him, they 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 treat him like he's not there. You said you started your career in journalism. Yeah. So how did that sort of lead on to creative writing? Was there a particular moment of epiphany where you said, I'm just going to be I I always thought that I would be a journalist and just a journalist. I, I didn't really have much of an intention. You know, when I was a kid, I I kind of I drew comic books and I I, I illustrated little books of my own. But by the time I was a teenager, I knew I wanted to go into journalism. And I, throughout uni, knew I wanted to be a journalist. I went into magazines which is a really stupid thing to do in the 21st century because uh, you just find that everyone uh, keeps closing the magazines down. Um, but I, it re I really always thought that novels were written by people smarter than me. Um, so I'd had ideas for books, but I think I thought there was this kind of like magic, mystic author thing that you had to innately know from the womb that you, you had it. Um, and then one day I had an idea, I had that first idea for the book and um, my wife, who is, is much more pragmatic than me, was like, well, stop talking about it, sit down and write the first page. So I did, and I wrote that first page and I knew I never wanted to do anything else because I, I realised you can just make things up for a living. <laughs> I think it is lots of fun. Uh, it's literally like, you know, like I said, playing with toys in a, in a sandbox. So I'm, be, I'm just a, a big child like Isaac. Um, I. I think there is this idea that, that that writing fiction, writing novels, is a inherent ability or gift, which it isn't. It's work, and I think it, it, it both reader and writer suffer if we if we don't treat it like work because it's really hard work at times. Writing and rewriting a book and doing all the research that goes into a book, all of the people who are not the author who are not on, named on the cover, the editors, the art directors, you know, it, a book is a massive amount of effort. But also, I think people, especially people who, um, you know, didn't grow up in artistic circles and, and go to certain schools and go to certain universities, feel like they can't write books because it's not for them. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame because I think writing is, is like really like anything where if you just put in loads of effort you can you can be better and if you write a first draft of a book you then have something that you can rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and that was definitely my my experience coming into it from journalism because I was so used to being edited and being told no this is wrong go back and rewrite it and then rewrite it again and rewrite it again and, and a book's really no different so I think I felt like going into writing fiction would be very different to journalism but it, it ended up being refreshingly similar I think once I, I kind of grasped it. I'm going to hop on the back of that with a question of my own as well actually yeah. if you don't mind. Um, you sort of mentioned about this idea of like that um, creative spark thing mm. there is. I always just I write myself as well I think the creative spark that people talk about is the doing. Do you have any yep. advice for writers who are trying to write to do that and struggling? There, There is I, I read a, a brilliant um, interview with a writer once who said 90, 95% of the writers who don't get published are the ones who don't finish the book. Um, because when you have a finished manuscript, it's actually, it's not easy to get published, but it, it's, there are a lot of routes to getting it in front of people. And if it's an idea that should, it is a fairly democratic industry in a lot of ways. And if, if you have a good idea, people can recognize that. Um, my advice to getting it done is, is, just kind of get it done. Uh, write, write every day. Write every day. Even if you write ten words a day, that's ten words closer to the finish line. But I am very aware that I'm I'm lucky enough to write full time. And even when I was even when I was a um, starting out, I was a freelance journalist, so I was writing full time. And I could always find the time. And I have so much respect for a lot of authors. And there are a lot of professional authors who write 
on on the side of a full time job or on the side of, of caring for a family full time and they'll you know wake up at five in the morning four in the morning and write and they'll they'll write on the weekends and they'll write in the evenings when the kids have gone to bed and it's incredible um, but I think really the only way to to make it as a writer is to just write constantly and if something doesn't work and I think I think this kind of comes naturally to anyone who is a writer because I think you'll know if, you, if you're a writer you kind of have to write even if no one's reading it it's, it's something that you feel like it's your meditation it's your it's your hobby it's your release so always writing even if you feel like it's never going to go anywhere or, or no one's ever going to read it I think just constantly writing personally having had that experience of, of a book failing and then a book succeeding I, th I think persevering and not getting not getting too downhearted if it doesn't work out in the first case is, is quite important. Thank you. Yes? Um, yes, yeah, speaking about interpretations of the egg, uh, we're all part of a book, book group here and we had discussions about your book. Um, one of the members who couldn't attend today was just wondering if there was any religious significance to it um, in terms of rebirth. Yeah, so there was, I, I basically, when I came up with the book, I wanted it to have this kind of twofold feeling and 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 half of that would be that it would feel like a, a kid's book and half of it was that it would feel almost like a, a bible story or like a, you know Isaac is very intentionally a, a biblical name and I, I wanted you to have this strange ethereal feeling with the egg that it is this 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 glowing white thing that that comes into his life and and kind of lifts him up um and the characters in that book uh, they have discussions about religion they, they they kind of reckon with religion in different ways because it's a it's really a story about um what lives on after after someone dies and i think you know that naturally is a a always going to have have elements of, of religion in it the kind of the metaphor of the egg it wasn't something i ever intentionally really interrogated in my own mind and i think Maybe I'm giving myself too much credit, but you know, I think I think the I guess the when you look at it, the, the obvious things are that it is a story about rebirth, and I, mean, I don't know how many people here have read Isaac and the Egg, so I don't want to spoil it too much. But I think it becomes obvious towards the end of the book why it's an egg, but that reason was never there in the first draft. So it, it's it's kind of funny the way it. The the way that the egg, as a, as an entity, as an egg, was always an egg. But in hindsight, I can I, there are all these different reasons it could be, and I I think that's probably subconsciously why it ended up being that. Yeah. I mean, it was quite ambiguous in the book anyway. And yeah, yeah. And that was that led to a lot of discussion in yeah. the group with different people just thinking different things, different mm -hmm. images in their minds, and yeah. different reactions. To it's it. so it's so nice to hear hear those because you know I have those conversations about books and it's. It's funny. I feel like I'm 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 ruining the author mystique by saying this, but it's like you you don't think too hard <laughs> about a lot of these a lot of these things. You just write them, and then you hear the discussions about them, and you're almost experiencing it for the first time as well. Because even if those um, undertones were, were were there, they're often subconscious because you don't you don't plan a book. You plan a book way more on a, on a plot level and a character level than a uh, what are the what, what are the deeper meanings because I think the deeper meanings just kind of come from they come naturally in the in the writing and then it's just a joy hearing people interpret things totally differently and 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 seeing seeing uh, even the you know like we're saying with the, the visual interpretations it, it's um, I've often I've always believed in um, what Philip Pullman calls the uh, democracy of reading and the idea that once you put a book out into the world your interpretation of it is just as valid as, as anyone else's so I am um, that's why I kind of I, I often dodge questions of like what did you mean by this because I'm like it doesn't matter what what you yeah. felt is what matters yeah Thank you. I think unless there's any other desperate last minute questions I think we might wrap it up there Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. and answering all our questions. Um, I think Bobby is going to be hanging around a little bit to sign yep, if yep, we definitely. want. We have a couple of um, library books available to borrow if you want to borrow it. And we also have some for sale um, courtesy of Next Page Books, um, which obviously you can only get 
the next page books one signed. You can't sign the library ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, please do come free and come over and free for a to have a little chat and maybe get some books signed. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and thank you, Kelly. Thank you.